Welcome to Science for Hire. With your host, Dr. Charles Handler. Science for Hire provides 30 minutes of enlightenment on best practices and news from the front lines of the employment testing universe. Hello and welcome to the latest edition of Science for Hire. I am your host, Dr. Charles Handler, and I... Well, I have a parade of really great guests. That's why I do this. And my guest today is Dr. Matt Barney. He's the founder and CEO of XLNC and uh, the the purveyor of TrueMind.ai. And I've known Matt for a very long time. Um, he's one of those people that every time I talk to him, there's like smoke coming out of my ears, not in a negative way, not because I'm mad, but because I'm like so much is going on that I'm trying to process. And we've shared a love for for some particular permutations of technology, let's say, over the years. And uh, and that's one of the reasons that I, you know, connected recently with him to catch up with what he's doing with all the generative AI stuff going on. I knew if there's anybody who's out there with this stuff, it would be it would be uh, Dr. Matt here. So I'm going to let him introduce himself and uh, and, you know, t- tell us as we get going a little bit about what you're doing right now and uh, what exciting stuff you're working on. So have at it. Appreciate it. I'm thrilled to be here. I've, as you know, I've always worked at kind of the intersection of tech, psychology and business. I've done a bunch with tech throughout my career, even back to grad school days, bunch of patents. All, most of those were the old school rules-based AI type stuff or just regular tech innovations. But about 10 years ago, I focused pretty much only on AI. And now in the last year, I've overhauled all that with the new large language model stuff that's explainable and trustworthy. And so lots of cool IO applications of this. And it's it's liberating and exciting to talk to you today about it because it's just, it's been so many years that I couldn't get stuff done that I can now. Oh yeah, I mean, that's what, that's like, you probably have a more specific thing in mind when you say that, like accomplishing things. But for me, it's, generative AI is about getting stuff done, man. I mean, I'm getting so much stuff done and I'm still having these moments where all of a sudden I think, wait a minute, why am I not using chat GTP? I helped my son study for a fourth grade math test last night and he forgot his review book and he also is in French immersion. So oh, I'm, a, I'm yeah. like, oh man, I got to figure this out. Wait a minute, I don't know French. What am I doing? I go to chat GTP, <laughs> generate me some two part word problems with multiplication and long division in French. Boom, totally. there we go. And then totally. he's hopefully going to do really good on his test today. So it's little things like that. And then big things like, oh, how are we going to change the world with this? How are we going to change hiring with this? And what the hell is this thing going to do to us? You know, so uh, and you recently when we were talking said that you I know you've been long time Bay Area. You said you're moving to was it New Hampshire? You remember well, yes, I have been fond of New Hampshire for many years, no income tax, no sales tax, highest density of entrepreneurs, the opposite of the People's Republic of California, where I've been since I left India about 10 years ago. Yeah, yeah. Interesting. Let's see. And I'm trying to remember oh, this. This is really I was just thinking, OK, what's the capital of New Hampshire? I know Vermont. Um, Concord, Montpelier, Concord, right? Concord, Concord. There, Concord. There we if you do that, yeah, like yeah. Mid- New England accent. <laughs> yeah, you got it down pretty well. You better, uh, you better get that before you move over there. Well, there, you're going to have snow uh, and nor'easters. I'm from Wisconsin, stuff, Charles, but, so know. like that, that doesn't bother me. I grew yeah. up in Madison, so yeah. It, oh, nice homecoming. Nice. Yeah, yeah, cool. So, so let's go. Let's rewind a little and let's talk a little bit about you know, lead ramp, if you don't, if you don't mind, like t- tell us a little bit about that product. When I saw that, I was like, wow, the possibilities, I know it's not a selection product, but for me, my mind started spinning about what the future would look like. And this was 10 years ago, maybe even a little more. So yeah, talk, talk about that journey, you know, that part of your journey and, and what was really cool about it what it did. Happy to. And, and actually, you're right. It didn't start out as a selection product, but it ended up being partially one in the end. Oh, cool. Um, you know, th- it came from scratching itches I had when I was mostly in multinationals at Merck, at Motorola, at Sutter Health before I 
ran the Infosys Leadership Institute, I just could never scale IO psychology that well with development. And it frustrated me. So at Sutter, I looked after 82 boards. At Infosys, I looked after uh, the senior most leaders and all their successors around the world. But it was just a nightmare to coach them all. And, you know, I was in India. Mm -hmm. So it's like it was a nightmare for me to get the team I needed. And, and so, and what really frustrated me was I worked for these, a billionaire, the chairman of the company, and people wanted coaching like they wanted their Lamborghini or their Rolex. It was a status symbol. These are high net worth people in India, billionaires and millionaires in India, you dollar. And, and so this is a way to de-risk coaching in between sessions. And it, the selection part of this was how do I find people that aren't going to squander this investment? And I actually went back to them when I left. They liked my AI enough and LeaderAmp that I said, all right, give me your top 5,000 senior female leaders that are good performers, and I'll, I'll find you the ones that are highest potential because they're only allowed to come into the AI coaching process if they deliberately, concertedly practice and get good scores on the computer adaptive tests, including 360s. So it was sort of a action learning selection internal internal of who gets who gets the extra investment because they're not going to squander it. So anyway, LeaderAmp was it was machine learning based and rules based psychology AI explainable, but it still had computer adaptive questions. Um, and there's and and I just and it's so hard to get the data for those machine learning models. You know, yeah, the training data. You mean exactly? I mean, what we consider large in psychology is ridiculously too small in computer science. And, you know, I had samples of 5,000 CEOs uh, talking to investors, high stakes, and almost none of them were even good with persuasion. So one of the AIs, I won an award in 2018 when I was at LeaderAmp from PSYOP for the Bray Howard Award. I could never finish it because if, if you don't have the data, you can't teach the stupid things. And so that's why and I left LeaderAmp almost two years ago now. Uh, my co-founder still runs it. But a year ago, is when the GPT 3.5 Turbo came out, and that really changed everything for me because uh, it solved all these problems. Yeah, yeah, I know. I was just thinking in my mind, well, you wish you had a you know GTP for that. But tell us a little bit, like describe what it actually did. I interacted with it, you know, and I'll I'll give my after you after you kind of uh, lay it down for us. I'll give my interpretation of why I thought it saw the possibilities in it, but yeah, tell us a little bit about how it worked. Like if I'm, if I'm using this app or this, this application that you created, what am I doing? And you're asking about leader amp. Leader amp. Stuff, yeah. Yeah. We'll get stuff. to the new okay. stuff. The old stuff. So the, the, the old school computer adaptive assessments that I did even at emphasis are way shorter, way more precise, right? Who wants a pain in the ass long assessment? Who wants one that's imprecise? But it was still a super big hassle to get the 360 surveys in. You can imagine at scale in a multinational, 25,000 raters in 50 countries. So instead of all that, what the app would do was help do let you do the self assessment, let you wait while you're the but you go nudge your stakeholders before. Uh huh. Like so, it's not just an e spam. It's like, hey, I care about your feedback, Charles. Would you mind spending a few minutes so like to shorten that cycle time? So the app helped you manage the 360. But while you're waiting for it, it lets you schedule artificially intelligent coaching. So we would calibrate psychologists authored low, medium and high coaching about what they ought to do and whatever it is they were trying to grow. Right. And they could schedule at least once a week, exactly the day and time the app would help you do that. And then they could practice. And the idea is they practice uh, deliberately, concertedly. If they have a coach, um, they also get reminded at the end of their day after they practiced it to journal about it. And the, the coach can then see the journal entry. The journal entry was fed into a machine learning based and rules based um, AI for emotion. So the coach could then intervene and see how they're doing, you know, before they're unpleasantly surprised and the, the client didn't do squat the next time they're together. So I, the ideal use case was high touch, high tech, the, the, the AI, the, the app did assessment and artificially intelligent coaching and nudge reminders. And then the human did, did the other parts around helping them, you know, in between sessions, ideally. Right. So, so in other words, it, it, the 360 would inform or the leader would inform on things that I might need to know about or work on. And then the, the, the product would say, Hey, uh, if you need to strengthen, 
you know, your resilience, uh, go run a marathon. I don't know, you know, stuff like that. Right. Yeah. Well, it was, so it had both the self-assessment dimensions are things that the, the individual is a better judge of, you know, like your optimism, your, your colleagues may not have any point of view about how you, your identity, your grittiness, you know, that kind of thing. Whereas the 360 is things like charisma, you know, it really doesn't matter what, how awesome, exciting you think you are. It's how other, everybody else responds to your charismatic behavior tactics from Johnny Antonakis. So we took, and, and in, like, in, if we just stick with charisma, John's done seminal work on what, you know, low, it's not hard to talk about the moral purpose of the team. It's damn hard to get exciting and tell a great story and use your nonverbals and modulate yeah. your voice and use three part list. So it would be appropriately challenging. The psychometric calibration and the AI would only give them stuff that's in their Goldilocks zone, not too hard, not too easy, right. but just, just in their sweet spot. Uh huh. Wow. So I would always thought of charisma as something that you're kind of, you either have it or you don't, you're born with it or not. Like no, trying it's to teachable. fake or. Yeah, let me really? tell you. Let me tell you about it. It's how no, can I have more charisma? What just just offhand? Like, what do I need to do? <laughs> John Antonakis has has done the seminal work in this area. He's the outgoing editor of Leadership Quarterly. He's literally done experiments. He, he's Greek, so he read the original Greek and pulled that into his studies. But he literally randomly assigned people to to experiments where he was able to show that not only subordinates outperformed when their leader was exciting, <laughs> but um, but the, the, they were seen as leader-like. And the, the, the original studies, this is so powerful, it got published in Nature, which never happens in IO psychology, right? I mean, he's done it on economic variables too, where he's literally um, counted how much money people donate or, or how, how much money the people trying to get philanthropic donations get. This was in the UK. So it's it's things like three part lists and using nonverbal behaviors and telling a great story, talking about the moral purpose of the team. Th those things are totally teachable. And, you know, in leader amp in, in one quarter, I could get a leader wherever they were on charisma. They could get five to 30 percent better in one quarter, which is like I it took me like a year to get that right with before that. Right. Because it's hard to get people to practice and exactly. And there's right. Three, right. Five. Ah, interesting. Yeah, I mean, I guess there's a difference between how you're operationally defining charisma here, which I believe is, is you know, perfectly great. When I think about it immediately, I just think of, you know, oh, there's people when they just walk in the room, all of a sudden, you know, they've got this light around them and everybody. And <laughs> that happens a lot with really famous people. I've had a chance to be around just like everybody in the travels of your life. You've, you've been in the same room with some famous person, and I'm not going to sit here and you know, name names, you know, like the <clears throat> Ringo star. Um, excuse me. So well, let me, <laughs> no, let, no, let me, let me build on that. I mean, did you know there's a psychology word for what you just described? It's called the romance of leadership, right? That there's this sexiness. And so to your point, I was working for these guys that created the entire software industry in India when I was in emphasis. And like literally when the founder was retiring at the last shareholder meeting, I had to be there on the stage with him. It's like he literally had elderly women singing songs to him, serenading him. They never met him but he's such a rock star. And he's got that that aura that people attribute yeah. to him. And sometimes that can go. Like I'm a big fan of Rush, you know, the band Rush. So I was watching the oh, documentary. Them. There's totally. a bunch of different documentaries, but, you know, I believe it was Neil Peart. He was talking. He's a very private guy anyway, but he was talking about like when they first had their first big commercial breakthrough, people coming to his house, you know, being on his lawn, just trying to get get to see him coming out the door. I mean, that kind of that kind of fanaticism to me, man, that kind of that's that's just not a good thing. That's that's um Anyway, that's people for you. They, they behave in all kinds of crazy ways. And we're just trying to help people be better. I mean, that's the way I look at it. Right. 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 So cool. Agreed. Well, I liked about that product was, you know, the distributed kind of ongoing dialogue you're having with technology and psychology at the same time. And so you're not just sitting down in one place to a coaching session. You're not just uh, like reading something offline, whatever. It's it's there when you need it and not there when you don't need it. And it's serving a purpose where the the bits of information compile over time into, uh, into a, a clearer picture that you can action on. I think about that for hiring. Although I think, you know, free range, free range hiring where the predictor is just you moving around doing stuff and you're being evaluated on it. We're not ready for that. I mean, the, totally. the, the hard part of all that is really not 
necessarily even the technology, but the paradigm of assessing someone for a job um, usually happens in a tightly controlled window where someone knows that it's happening and has opted into that and it, it happens and then ends. But this kind of thing, it's, it's like the paradigm is all busted and there's reasons for that paradigm, legal reasons, uh, privacy reasons, whatever. So it, it might be a pipe dream to get to that point, but you could simulate it, you know? I don't think so. No, no. I See, I think even, even right now, a part of your free range vision is possible. So like, like um, test gorilla, right? It's got the ability to ask video questions, capture the data, do the transcription. Now that's still normal kind of structured interview type of setting. So it's not so weirdo. We're not talking Twitter data. You know, the European Union just came out with a bunch of rules that make it even more difficult for us. But that we could still get, it's, it's not full of free range, but it's like just purely what they say, we can now measure stuff with extreme precision just from that with this new AI. Yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah. I mean, that exactly right. And so it's to me, I again, I envision it as you got your phone, you're doing stuff, maybe you're at your regular job, maybe there's even simulated stuff coming over your phone, like a call from somebody that's part of this synthetic organization, you got to talk to them, then you got to like, go online, check your email, get the, get the information. So a little bit like an assessment center, but it's not just all sitting down in one place. And, you know, boy, if you could have AI generated collaborators, coworkers, clients, whatever, and you're you're interacting with those. Totally. And that that might stretch over a couple of days. Oh man, I got a big presentation tomorrow. I just got the stuff tonight. What am I gonna do? Again, there is also the typical versus maximum performance idea, right? So if you're if you're in a that's right situation like that, you're gonna you're gonna potentially behave differently. But we we know that's something we've been we've been dealing with for a very long time. So new stuff then, XLNC, TrueMind, AI. I, I mean, you when we talked kind of pre, pre this recording, again, you were kind of smoking my ears talking a little bit about, uh, I mean, obviously generative AI is part of this. So let's start a little bit with how are you using generative AI right now to build new things? Tell us a little bit about that. Sure, and, and actually it, piggybacks on what you just said. I'm already doing pieces of your free range vision, not just in a pre-hire sense. And I think it's less hostile in developmental work than it yeah, is in pre-hire, right? The, the litigation factors, the science is the same. It's just that the litigation sensitivity when it's about my development is much less than if it's about me getting promoted or getting the job, right? Yeah, there's no life altering decisions that are being made based on that, right? There's, I mean, there could be exclusion for sure, but you're right. I mean, the the lens is always on hiring. That's right. But but what I'm doing now, so when GPT 3.5 came out, I was like, oh my gosh, we don't need to train the AI anymore. We just need to prime it. It's so similar to psychology. Instead of programming in language, we do it in English and we frankly use psychology ways. And so what I've been able to do is take normal psychology of low, medium and high for whatever dimension. I started with persuasion because I've worked with Bob Cialdini for many, many years. Um, and there's lots of uses in organizations, right? Leaders persuade, salespeople, lawyers, right? They persuade for for a living, and so, but but they often get some of it wrong. So I've been We're able all to selling. We're all selling all the time. It doesn't matter if you don't think you're selling. If you're <laughs> trying to navigate your way through a day, you're selling to somebody. And you want to do it in a wise way, right? In a way that that enhances floats all boats. You don't want to burn relationships out with it. And that's that's really Cialdini's approach. So I built Cialdini Bot to complement with, with friends. I helped Bob Cialdini launch a new institute called the Cialdini Institute that's got the, his like a flip classroom type of approach to training and coaching. But even there, you know, what are people doing in between coaching sessions or when they're done with their coaching? If they want to, we all have blind spots and we often overlook Cialdini principles. So the AI can not only coach you, but when you're ready, measure anything you've got. So to your point about free range, right now I've got people using Cialdini Bot with Zoom sessions or they scrape a website and measure it all and get feedback. So it's not as, as like graceful as I think your vision is of like, I don't have to do much and get all this information and track it. But when I want to, if I wanna go see before I go pitch the board or before I go 
try and raise my capital as a, with the VCs, if I want to see if my approach is good or if I'm missing something big, there's nothing like this. Uh, yeah. So that's my exciting kind of next steps to AI. Because like anything you can dream up, what took me years at LeaderAmp, I can do in about a month now. Yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, I, let's take a quick pause too, because when you talked about Bob Cialdini, I'm going to be honest, I had no idea who Bob Cialdini is. So um, maybe a lot of people do. But tell us a little bit about that person and how you're how you're capturing his essence in your tool, you know, like what, what is he all about? Yeah. Professor Cialdini is the world's most cited living social psychologist in the area of persuasion. Um, he's like the pioneering researcher, but he's not just a geeky academic. He is unique because even in the sixties, before you and I were born, Charles, he was surreptitiously taking jobs with salespeople, um, you know, at restaurants, doing cold calling lawyers, the, the Hari Krishna, Hari Ramas back in the 70s, he would study these people and create these very clever experiments. At the airport? Had, the, exactly. And how is it that, you know, people would, the Hari Krishnas, if you, for those oh, of you that aren't old enough, I remember. I remember them too. But, but for those who don't know, back in those days, the Hari Krishnas would be there, they'd give you paper flower, and people would give them money, and then they just throw the paper flower out. And that these weren't Hari Krishna supporters, but it was the rule of reciprocity where you feel an obligation to give back. He, he wrote some consumer grade New York Times bestsellers in the late 80s and then multiple others. And he's, he's, he's a, like World Economic Forum level, rare psychologist up with the Daniel Kahneman who won the Nobel Prize. He's at that level of psychology. But what's very, very special about him now is unlike most of us geeky IOs, he's super good at tailoring his speech to his audience. That's why he can get six figures for a one hour talk <laughs> with W world, you know, with fortune 50 types. I've worked with him for about 20 years back in my Motorola days. I'd required all my, my Motorola six Sigma master black belts to become credentialed, you know, proficient in his stuff. I, I, my, for my 2018 award from SIOP was based on his stuff. I just never could finish it until now. Right. But right. he's his, his approach is seven universal things that move people in our direction in a totally ethical way. Mm. And so they're, they're not hard, they're superficially, um, deceptively easy to understand, but the devil's in the proverbial details, how you use them fully. Yeah, yeah, and you know what? You've persuaded me to like Bob <laughs> Cialdini quite a bit. And as a psychologist, oh man, I'm like, well, how did I not know about this guy? But I played around, you set me up He's on social. the- yeah, He's yeah. not I.O., that's why. <laughs> yeah, but man, social psychologists have all the fun, man. Think about like the uh, your Stanford prison experiments, or I, I remember true. a really interesting, a uh, really interesting one, <laughs> social psychology study. It was about, uh, and you can't, well, you don't see this anymore either. People with gun racks in their pickup trucks. Like I grew up yeah. in Tennessee, right? And yeah, I'm, yeah. I'm proudly, uh, although my parents are from the uh, East and my family, Family roots are from Eastern Europe. Uh, I grew up kind of a redneck a little bit. <laughs> I had a gun rack, but no gun because I bought a truck and it had one in there. But uh, <laughs> but and nowadays, boy, you can't do that. But uh, and it makes intuitive sense. But people follow a vehicle with a gun rack at much more distance than they would one without a gun rack. Right. Just little fun stuff like that where you're like, well, I wonder how people react in this situation and why. It's pretty cool. Um, it's pretty cool. And there's definitely a, a, you know, bleed over. But I played around with the Cialdini bot you set me up with. So I asked it, I just goofy, you know, how do I persuade my wife to let me buy a new expensive lawnmower? You know, and it came <laughs> up with some pretty good, clear. I mean, the dimensions uh, are there. And then it says, try this, try this and try this. And um, that's pretty good coaching. I don't really need a lawnmower. I just was coming up with something <laughs> random. But uh, but anyway, so I, I've interacted with that. So where is where is the generative AI? Like, how are you incorporating that? Like you said, the high, medium, low, you were telling me, right? One of the things, I'll, I'll just set this up too. As I'm thinking about generative AI in products, right? Um, I broke it down into kind of three things. There's the there's the building assessment, right? So what 
what scenarios, what questions do we ask? Where do we, what signal, what are we doing to elicit signal from somebody? Then there's the actual deployment of it. So they're interacting with something and there's an LLM uh, in there that is, is part of that interaction. And then there's the analysis. How are you looking at all this stream of data? How are you trained to evaluate complex data and make a judgment about it, right? So it's scoring essentially. So those are the three nodes you can you can use this stuff. That's in the assessment paradigm. But but tell us a little bit. So my point being on that diversion is you we were talking about the the rating scales or the the performance levels that we don't have to mm -hmm. sit there. How many times have you? I mean, you've been maybe functioning at a less in the trenches than me, but I know in my career I've written narrative feedback statements ad nauseum where I'm just taking one, cloning it from low to medium, changing the language a little, putting, it takes a hell of a lot of time and it's no fun. And, and every situation in clients different. So you can't just use the same ones all the time. Anyway, so there you go. No, I'm with you. So there's kind of three ways I'm addressing those in a, um, that really go beyond and are liberating from our classic hassles like you just described. One is kind of classic computer science with new large language models. I can talk about that. The others are active and passive that are purely psychometric. But I start with what is the job related constructs I care about, right? And Cialdini's got very clear science. Okay, cool. We know what what matters, what predicts, would, but we want to make sure that damn LLM is going to behave itself. So I, I one of the things I did, I used to write them manually, but now I've got GPT-4 saying, give me a low, medium, and high item. And an item, instead of an item item, it's a prompt, It's a, it's a, a, which is just an English description of what you want the, the LLM to do. And I'm basically ah, writing it so that the large right. language model is a synthetic rater, like a human in a, in a assessment center. Basically. Wow. Wow. So we need that. I mean, honestly, I've said for a long time, the, you remember back in the, you never hear this term anymore, but when I was like in the Bay Area in 2000, it was killer app. Right, the, the next killer app, the thing that's going to take us to the next level, and I've always thought in what we do, boy, if you could get if you could get technology to replace a human, a trained human raider, making complex synth synthesized judgments, not necessarily even did you answer this SJT right, which is, you know, kind of a baby version of that, but I'm talking assessment centers, etc. Boy, that is an unlock because then you then you can scale this stuff without losing the stuff that we psychologists are really so good at building and training totally. people. On. So, so yeah, that's, that's what you're talking about, right? It's, it, it is. And it's mandatory. I mean, if any of you used Am Amazon Mechanical Turk or any of its competitors, like they were always been a hassle because a lot of bogus stuff, but it's much worse now because they're using GPT-4 to generate their, their Turk. So now it's garbage. Yeah. And, and the beauty of it is this stuff works so much better than humans, like yeah. literally medical grade level reliability. If you, if you tune right. The LLMs, right. With yeah. The right prompts. Yeah. Yeah. And we've seen machine learning, more simplified machine learning, do that, you know, just taking, using a whole lot of uh, outcomes as training data, right. And, and having experts do the same rating and looking for the, you know, the, consistency there and then you know making sure the ai is trained to do that but this is more than that so so how is that this more than some of the simpler applications that we've seen so far you know that's right and so what's beautiful about the llms is you can literally just like you write different items in a traditional test you can have completely different paradigms about thinking about the latent trait you know bob hogan has a slightly different take on prudence than the Neo PI did on conscientiousness. So if you're making that kind of, a, you, you can have those compete and literally tell the LLM to act as Bob Hogan versus Costin McRae, literally in different prompts or at the same time. So that's at the, that's at the assessment level. Then we make sure we calibrate both the LLMs and the prompts and the people on the same ruler with the technique from psychometrics from Roche measurement called the many facet Roche model. And then once we get it, we stick that into an inverted cat. I invented this in 2010. So computer adaptive test only for LLM. So we already know what prompts are hard and easy. We know what the biases of each of the LLMs being used. And as you, it ingests the text that you're playing with Cialdini bot, that's what it's using step by step for each of Cialdini's uh, principles to estimate where you are. And if you want more precision, of course, it takes longer than if you want something quick and dirty. Inverted cat. That sounds like a yoga pose or something. I've, I've never heard inverted <laughs> cat before. 
Wow. So yes, well, I'm just trying to think about how that all works. So, so when you're training, when you're, when you said feed it, you know, it's, is it Bob Hogan? Is it Costa McRae? Are you actually doing some kind of like retrieval augmented generation, like a rag? Are you just fine tuning? Mm -mm. Are you feeding it anything? You're feeding it papers or what feeding it i'm only feeding it to the 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 prompts to make sure the the construct and all sub facets are completely nailed and i'm doing it not just for the prompts but here's the kicker we can traditional psychometrics it always irritates us that we've got more precision in the middle of the, the thing than we do in the tails right mm. the, it's kind of a bathtub curb of error information in classical test theory and in irt so there's more noise in the tails and of course that's where you really want to find high performers or you know low performers so so like where we care the most we had the least information historically why because of the normal distribution of our you know our populations we just don't have big samples in the tails by definition so what i what i've done with gpt4 is also create samples specifically at those levels right so right. It, so i over engineer the sample I'll, i had real human samples plus these synthetic ones and now i got super small standard errors and per, per you know Excellent calibrations, no matter what level I care about. Interesting. See, it's interesting because when I talk to people about assessment tools, I I always say, yeah, well, you know, picking picking from the middle hump of a distribution is hard because there's a lot of people lumped in there and they're pretty similar. But man, if you can just hire the people on the right hand, you know, one, two standard deviations above sure. and on the left hand, you can kick those people out. You know, who cares about the middle as much? But what you're saying is the middle has got the most, it, it's just because of the numbers, right? Is that is that basically it? Your logic's absolutely sound. I'm just pointing out the confidence interval. You got a lot more noise on those those high ones than you do in the middle, just because you got a ton of information there to calibrate those, those mm, items. Interesting. Wow. So when you're talking about, I think when you're talking about kind of feeding it the, the information, are you talking like you're anchoring it in an objective definition saying, okay, Correct. this is how Bob Hogan defines personality right. here's the specific stuff now use this right you're telling it now use this you are now bob hogan in this situation exactly Draw from it, this yeah exactly and and unlike so the computer scientists are so far behind us psychologists in measurement it's embarrassing they, they treat our our instruments like some kind of gold standard they see what percent of the time their machines can yeah their validation concept it, is very different than ours. It never here. passed Psych yeah. 101 for us. But, right. but so what I did is I took their hypotheses and our normal psychology ideas of like behavioral anchored rating scales. You know, bars with examples outperform all the computer science stuff in assessment. And why? Because, you know, these are these are things trying to emulate humans. And we know something about humans. <laughs> if they don't know, they're just full empirical. So just like you said, multiple examples it turned out even content relevant emojis helped the llms get better i didn't expect really? that I, I threw it in there because that's that's true in persuasion and priming cognitive psych but it works with those too so explain that real quickly but like you're throwing emojis in there what what is what exactly are they doing it's so just like with humans where you prime them and then they behave a little differently because of what came before it's the same thing here only it's you know it's obvious with text this is about persuasion and the principle of reciprocity right, right. and they're giving right. gifts it's not obvious it's but it's trying to get the llm to kind of activate its thinking in those areas and it turns out content relevant emojis like if i'm give, talking about giving a gift something the other person cares about little gift emoji it helps the llm get a little bit better not a big effect but it's like enough that like all right i'm throw them in right what about the poop emoji <laughs> I, I didn't try the workplace i other than yeah i know, I know. people i didn't I, know. I didn't test that well one. it's just a joke but llms love emojis man they talk to you in emojis no problem and they're usually the right emoji you know to have in there which is it's it's interesting, right? Because they see, and I play around with Dolly a lot. Yeah. And now, you know, look, we're moving toward, we're moving toward this multimodal situation right. where that, that's just the next step to you're having your own personal agent that you just tell to do stuff, right? Totally. Um, you can accomplish yeah. multiple phases of one project within the walls of the, of the, of the LLM, right? So that's pretty interesting. But, but Dolly, what I think is really fascinating and you may know more about this than me, like when when you actually download an image or you look at like it, it'll describe it, it'll say this is doing this, this and this. And I'm like, is that enough? Like it's it's thinking in words and images at the same time. 
some of that some of that gets scrambled around pretty interestingly but on the back end of this is it really just that text that describes the image that we see as the label or is there more detail under there do you know what i'm talking about i do i do i think th the way i like to think of this is kind of like think back to your appalachian tennessee days as a kid like those kids wouldn't have the same worldview. They wouldn't be as worldly. And if they happen to be one of the Klansmen, they would have a very biased worldview than you did growing up the way you did, right? And so I think it's the same here. We don't really know in DALI or Mid Journey or in GPT-4, we don't know exactly what data are in there and they don't know why they work. Just like, you know, like you teach a kid a bunch of racist, sexist stuff from the KKK, like, duh, we would kind of predict that person might not come out as good as one of us did that don't think and work that way. So same thing here. It, it matters. The beauty of what I'm offering to psychology types is we can, no matter how goofy that is, we just have to keep it in its cage. <laughs> we keep it in its cage that we define the science of and we don't let it out. So it doesn't embarrass us because- yeah. Dally to sometimes generates racist, sexist, or because it's got stereotypes just like humans do. Yeah, yeah. I haven't seen any of that, but it, it'll add extra limbs. I mean, if you really study stuff, you can see these weird and the writing. I'm sure they'll get it dialed in, but the the writing where you ask it to write stuff. I mean, it. it I was doing some color stuff with my kid, and it came up with like purple. You know, is the name of a color. I mean, it's just not quite there. To me, it's pretty damn funny. You know, Agreed. there's a. Um, there's a, a newsletter thing, it's something like ridiculous AI or something like that. It just shows you a bunch of images, kind of like, you know, there used to be a site where you could look at like mispronunciations of English and writing in different countries and stuff. And it's funny. So that stuff's very human. Or damn you autocorrect. <laughs> I know it's not exactly <laughs> the same thing, but did you ever read that? Damn you autocorrect? Yeah, yeah, those are good. Oh my God. I'm just rolling on the floor laughing with some of those. Such So much inappropriate stuff coming back from autocorrect it's fascinating stuff and i mean wh where geez so you're describing solving a lot of problems advancing things in a way that we haven't been able to do i think it's like the sky's the limit with the creativity people have in terms of how totally. right so like i'm learning yeah. and thinking of new things so what like fast forward five years to the same kind of stuff we've been talking about what's it going to look like Five years, 10 years, I don't know. Putting the years around it is nuts because with generative, it's it's just it's happening so, so effing fast, it's man. It's true. We cannot keep it's up. It's totally true. Right. No, to your, to your point, like, let me talk more about the feedback and what you do with measurement because the measurement's already there. <laughs> What's more exciting, like the multimodal gets you like, not only do you get the measurement on like all the damn time, which is so amazing. Instead of snapshots, we can get it your your free range thing. You get it all the time. That's huge. That's huge for so many things, not just science, but practice feedback. On the feedback side, we have parts of this today, but not multimodal, where we can make sure the feedback is appropriately challenging. It's in the Goldilocks zone and it's using all the science about how you give feedback and convince them to use it. So I think I think it's gonna evolve to beyond like a Grammarly for your job, it's gonna be more like your your personal assistant that's monitoring you and giving you feedback and helping you. The performance management stuff that's a classic bugbear for our field is gonna go away. It's gonna be super transparent. It's gonna be more about, well, where am I? Where's my team? And what do we do to help achieve our shared goals? You know, So ProMez and Pritchard's work, I think it's a renaissance and it's super yeah, yeah. liberating for those of us that are keen on working with it. Yeah, yeah. So thinking about, I just remember, you know, anytime you talk to somebody who's got to do their performance reviews, oh my God, I got 50 performance reviews to do. It's that time of year. It, and it's a slog. And then part of it is, okay, man, are you really being able with that workload to give people your best? So, so imagine that. I think what the downside of that is, well, there's no human touch. Do you just want a bot giving you your performance review? Or is it that the at the bot is equipping the performance reviewer with all the information to then personalize yeah. the feedback. No, I think right? it's the That's latter. It. It, it totally flips the relationship. Instead of the, the, nobody likes performance evaluations, but instead of that, it's performance management where the measurement's ubiquitous and the job of the manager is to coach you and help remove yeah. barriers, yeah, right? Totally. That's it's way not better. once, yeah, yeah. And even just your pulse surveys and feedback, you know, ongoing feedback, I mean, that's nothing new but my my little thing i just wrote down on my notebook is like 
I think we're moving from a snapshots to a movie, totally, right? Like totally. that's how this stuff works. And these moments in time give you some signal, but a continuous flow of movie data gives you a lot more signal. You know, it tells a richer story, including your, your, your um, pulse surveys. Those today we could do those like once a week for the team, for the org, just from, from email, from Slack, from discord scrape like that's and no, no more pain in the ass questionnaires if you wanted to yeah well questionnaires are there's no doubt in my mind that they're going away like i mean we we are going to see a, an era where you're you know a likert scale will be in a museum next to the tyrannosaurus rex skeleton or something <laughs> um most likely but i think we have a way to go i'll tell you you know in my travels i talk to a lot of people who use assessment and the like I still work on projects which is straight up knowledge based multiple choice questions, right? So, the, and there is a um, it's interesting to think about. It's just like electric cars replacing ICE internal combustion cars, right? I mean, the electric car stuff's there. You know, we know how to use it. It's getting better and better, getting more user friendly. Whether it actually saves the environment more is debatable, given the the battery. To, you know, to, to, there's all kind of things there. I don't want to get into, but you know, it's, it's kind of like the same thing. Like we're still reliant on the old stuff that we know works and can, can deal with, but slowly, slowly the new stuff's going to take over. And at what time is it? Is it the same timeline? We don't really know. I think there's a, there's a fear and maybe justifiably so that like, if you can't touch the item or the thing that's measuring, like, can you trust it? You know, that's, that's something that I feel like is well, possible. Let me touch on that. Two pieces of minds, one science and one technical, but there's massive work with the older AI from a, a developmental psychologist named Theo Dawson, her company's called Lectica, where she's done what I've just described to you, but the old school way and a lot of manual coding with pure knowledge, the kind of knowledge items you're just describing and purely just based on text. So I'm optimistic there, but the, the touch and feel the item, it, it's a, it's a double-edged sword. You know, the downside is what you're saying. If people like that work, that's a challenge or, you know, especially subject matter experts. So that's their, that's their worldview. But the other hand, SMEs often require you to destroy some of the best items because they don't like them for some stupid non psychometric reason. I know, I know. So that that's hugely liberating to take that out and saying you don't really like going through that pain in the ass knowledge test. Well, give me this following samples and I don't need them anymore. And th and then you just make sure, and this is the European Union and the New York City uh, new AI legal rules require audits. I think that's where this is going. So the, the, the psychometric audits will look at the prompts, make sure your psychometrics are good, but do do sub do non psychologists really want the pain in the ass questions? I don't think so. I think they just want to trust that the information's good and it's painless. Yeah, exactly. I mean, we're just taking a layer out using technology. But I, my point is, I think it's going to be even with the capabilities growing, which they're always going to grow faster than adoption in the enterprise space, especially in the in the new era of intense regulation, which we're getting to ready to go into. It's happening and it's always going to be behind the technology. That's nothing new. I mean, remember, remember 20 some years ago, the big brouhaha. Oh, un the UIT, unproctored internet testing. Oh my God, we can't allow this. No way. Well, guess what? Allow it or not is happening. So you better get used to it. And I mean, it's, it's some of the same stuff, but regulation wise that there wasn't anything there. Now, sure. now we've got we got a lot of regulation. We don't know how it's all going to be, you know, exactly executed. The thing that's interesting to me about regulation, I was just having this conversation yesterday. You might have a New York law, a couple California laws, the, the No Robot Bosses Act or whatever, I think is, is you know, all these things. And then the EU uh, law. Well, if you're trying to comply and you got all these disparate things that might have different requirements, to me, though, if you fall back on an ethical framework, because if you look at the ethical frameworks, they're all basically the same, right? The basic truths about how to be ethical, right, and equitable. And so it's it's really like, okay, if you can check these boxes, you might have to run a data set a different way or something to satisfy one of these things. Um, but then also, the big thing we've never really had to deal with 
is that vendors and purveyors of these things are going to have to be audited independently. Agree. Um, and nobody knows what the hell that's going to look like. And there's just, you know, there's so much opportunity even there for chicanery and crap. So, you know, just do it right. So I'm, I'm here to help with that. I mean, I'm excited because I've I'm calling these guardrails for computer scientists who don't know anything about our stuff or care. But to the point you're making, Cialdini has a very excellent model of ethics, whether the information is true, whether it's natural to the situation, it's not contrived and whether it's wise. And I have I have 366 percent more precision in my measures of ethics using Cialdini's framework and my AI than physician credentialing tests. And so you could see where you could have an active guardrail and make sure GPT-4 isn't allowed to send anything that's not ethical, right? Yeah, and it does that a little bit on its own, and then it there's does. the, okay, this is more you, of a you can hardcore it. quality guarantee than there's, they yeah. can't guarantee it the way I can. Yeah, I think if you, if, yeah, there's all kind of little, that's the other interesting thing is, is that there's kind of the, just like anything, just like, you know, any security-based thing, there's people who figure out how to get around it, and then there's the how do we patch that? And then there's another sure. worm that sure. comes out. Sure. And then it's, you know, and we may always be dealing with that. I think in the early, early days of ChatGTP, at least public facing, like a little less than a year ago, there was a lot of, hey, we can we can get it to divulge this or that, right. you know, for us. Whereas the, you don't hear about that as much these days because I'm sure they're patching stuff up. That's exactly right. But that's got, it's mixed blessing for us assessment types. So that's why... My current AI is way better than GPT-4 using open source, uh, an ensemble of them, because what GPT-4 did to us in the earlier part of the year, they didn't tell us they were doing that. And we we noticed the defect density was getting really bad because like half the time it wouldn't spit out an integer that we want. It wouldn't behave itself. With the open source ones, you have so much more control over it than we do with them. Yeah, yeah. Well, you do. Yeah, I'm working with a, a friend of mine has a company called Bookend AI that, that creates a secure wrapper for open source models, right? And then you can fine tune them in there. And I'm really learning a lot about, you know, at first I thought, oh, you just build a product on ChatGTP. No, because it's it's proprietary and own. You can't get in there and change it. You can change it by your in and out, like collectively a million people interacting with it can can help fine tune it on stuff. But but in general, you don't own that thing. You can't you can't make it do your own purpose. What, you know? And what I've found is you don't even need to do the fine tuning. You just need to do the fine priming. And then you want predictable that it's going to behave the same way in your validation study as it does in the future. And you can't guarantee that if you just use GPT-4. Yeah, yeah. Well, very cool. So I know we're getting up to time here. Uh, tell everybody a little bit about, as we kind of wind out here, about TrueMind AI, what what you all do, what, what, what's, what reason would someone contact you for and how you can help them? Yeah. Appreciate it. We pioneer this kind of trustworthy, explainable AI for any kind of purpose. Obviously, as an IO psych guy like you, that's where my head usually goes, but we're also supporting the regular computer science community. I'm working with the International Coaching Federation to redefine their standards. You can see where this would be a brilliant way to credential them because they, they, you know, a lot of coaching post COVID happens through recordings. I'm working with leadership development specialists, several different ones around more classic reports in some cases, other cases, assessment type thing and feedback. So we custom create those. We, our first we did with the Professor Cialdini's company, the Cialdini Institute. So that's what Cialdini bot is. But you can see where this is an all purpose, unobtrusive assessment and coaching approach. And it could be at the individual, the team, the organizational level. We're looking to collaborate um, with others who already have domain expertise that we don't necessarily have and markets to custom create that stuff and make it scale because it's so easy to do compared to what the old school stuff was. Right. And so you're taking, it sounds like a combination of open source LLMs and putting them in a kind of secure environment where you're teaching them and, uh, and they're accessible within a product. That's exactly right. And in most many cases, headless API. So the same fancy pants science, but maybe it's the customer's UI UX, their, their interface, right. not right. ours. Right. And are you going to like hugging face or something and looking for um, these models? Yeah. Or are you building them yourself? Or? We're not building them ourselves. That, that's what's brilliant about this. The, op the open source LLMs, even the smaller ones, you don't have to use the big ones. The smaller ones are superhuman in emulating what an assessment rater would do. So 
we've been extremely happy with those things. They've been, we didn't need to fine tune them. We just need to get them from Hugging Face or some other open source spot. Yeah. 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 For people who don't know, and I just, I just learned, you know, you hear Hugging Face, interesting name, but it's a repository with all kind of open source. And I think there's thousands, that's thousands right. of them. That's on right. There, right. But you got to be careful when you pull those down. And that's where you got to kind of do your own governance. Good deal. Well, we are up on time. And I, I always say this. I'm never going to stop saying it, but uh, honestly, like tell people how they can keep track of you. And you're going to say I'm on LinkedIn because everybody is. Is there anything beyond being on LinkedIn that that people should know about following you? Yeah, my team's work is on TrueMind, T-R-U-M-I-N-D dot A-I. And uh -huh. the the company that that owns TrueMind dot A-I is X-L-N-C dot C-O. Those are the, the spots you can find me. Good deal. Well, thank you so much for your time today. Dr. Matt Barney, uh, prophet of, of this stuff. So. <laughs> Thanks for having me. As we wind down today's episode, dear listeners, I want to remind you to check out our website, rockethire.com, and learn more about our latest line of business, which is auditing and advising on AI-based hiring tools and talent assessment tools. Take a look at the site. There's a really awesome FAQs document around New York City Local Law 144 that should answer all your questions about that complex and untested piece of legislation. And guess what? There's going to be more to come. So check us out. We're here to help. <laughs>